The FIA implemented aerodynamic testing restrictions, or ATR, to try help bring the field closer together. These work by placing limits on CFD and wind tunnel development. But what are the details of these restrictions? To help explain more, I've chosen a few of the most interesting letters of law. Firstly, defined by the general conditions, a three-dimensional representation of an F1 car, or subcomponent subject to restricted aerodynamic testing, is defined as Restricted Aerodynamic Test Geometry, or RATG. Now, RATG is specified such that you cannot add, remove, morph, or modify the geometry. This is important as the regulations are based around the teams having a finite number of RATG. This effectively limits how many designs they can trial, and I'll talk about this more later. Notice that the ruling mentions a three-dimensional representation. This means that teams could develop as much as they wanted to in 2D. For example, you could look at profile selection on the front wing. However, clearly Formula 1 is so developed that the usefulness of such simulations would be marginal at best. If your RATG contains external bodywork on both sides of the car, they must be symmetrical about the centre of the car. This effectively outlaws teams from running two aerodynamic concepts but only accruing one RATG. Interestingly, sections of an RATG used for restricted CFD simulations may be created by removing geometry from the parent RATG and replacing with a boundary condition created by that RATG itself. Now, this rule indicates that F1 teams are probably developing using the following technique. Imagine you're working on the rear of the car. You could extract the flow field from a simulation and use that to derive your boundary condition to then simulate just the rear of the car, massively reducing the computational cost. This method could be used everywhere in the car, for example, uh, to remove cooling systems. But in our example, as soon as you change the rear geometry, it'll cost you another RATG. Furthermore, even if you leave the rear geometry but update the boundary condition to represent another flow field other than from the parent simulation, you'll also gain another RATG. You can perform tests with multiple cars, but not really in the wind tunnel, and we'll get to that soon. However, each car used accumulates another RATG, and any position change relative to each other is, again, another RATG. Wind tunnel testing is restricted based on the number of runs where the wind greater than 5 meters a second signifies the start of a run, wind on time, this is where the wind is greater than 15 meters a second, and occupancy time, where occupancy time begins at the start of the first run and ends at the end of the last run of that shift. This means that you can prepare or pack up before or after your runs as much as you'd like provided that you're not running the tunnel at the same time, which is what I imagine most F1 teams would be doing to reduce their occupancy time if that's a limiting factor. There are further restrictions on the types of wind tunnel technology that you can actually use. Firstly, all wind tunnels must use air at atmospheric pressure. This prevents teams trying to achieve dynamic similarity by matching Reynolds numbers to their on-track conditions. They also cannot use designs which create curved flow conditions relative to the model. It seems like the FIA are trying to prohibit designs which could emulate true cornering conditions. It also prohibits potential for non-F1 representations that create an F1 style wake to measure aerodynamic performance when behind another car. Models are limited up to 60% of full size and the maximum speed that you can use is 50 meters a second relative to the model. So clearly you can't just speed the model up into the flow to gain a higher Reynolds number. Furthermore, you can only use one model per run, which limits any multi-car testing. The wind tunnel has the following permitted degrees of freedom. Wheel rotation, ride height, roll, load through the wheels, steer, changes to your relative to the incident airflow and or the ground plane, exhaust flow, front wing flap angle, rear wing flap angle, and adjustment and operation of any sensors. Now it's noted that the rates of ride height and roll are limited. Interestingly, as I mentioned with your, you can choose to just rotate the front for the Formula One car, or you could rotate the Formula One car and the rolling road beneath. Now, scrubbing the tyres would be much more accurate for contact patch deformation and relative ground motion, but you could run into correlation issues if you're wearing out the tyres too much, potentially disrupting ride heights. So that seems like a really interesting trade-off that the teams would have to make. Now, where you use non-rigid tyres, the tyres must be supplied by Pirelli. 
Moreover, devices which alter the shape of the tyre without using vertical or horizontal loads reacted at the contact patch are prohibited. This potentially seeks to ban internal devices which could morph the tyre more effectively. There are less permitted degrees of freedom in CFD. Ride height, roll, yaw, steer, and tyre shape. This doesn't intrude true cornering domains, which means if a team wanted to perform such a simulation, it would cost them an, another RATG. The CFD is limited by compute resource based solely on the solving side of CFD. This means that you can do as much pre and post as you like, meaning teams are likely to spend a lot of time getting computationally efficient meshes and initializations whilst going all out on the post-processing. AUH is allocation unit hours, which is based on NCU, the number of processing unit cores, NSS, the number of solver wall clock seconds, and CCF, the peak processing unit clock frequency. So clearly you want to hit your maximum frequency and stay there. Also, the trade-off between cores and solve time can be complicated, but I really don't know enough about that regarding the compute resources that F1 teams use. I imagine that they'd spend a lot of time trying to improve parallelization. Not all runs are considered restricted CFD simulations, provided that they meet certain criteria, but I won't go into details about those. In other words, it is possible to work on development methodology without using your restricted compute time. And there's similar regulations for wind tunnel development. Now, all these limits that I've been mentioning are based on the championship position at the end of June and at the end of the season, meaning that it's updated twice a year. For every update, the teams could get a new C coefficient. The C coefficient for the top team is only 70%, and the bottom 115%, with every other team linearly spaced between. Now, all limits are scaled by the C coefficient. Based on these limits, we can make some assumptions. The average wind tunnel run would be about 15 minutes and you're allowed 75 minutes of occupancy on average per run. Now this means that you'd have roughly 60 minutes per change, but that's very on average, because some changes you might be changing the entire model, which would take longer and others shorter. Now if I assume that the top team has 60 aero developers and works 240 days a year, each developer has only three RATGs per week. If I then assume the bottom team has only 20 aero developers, over the same period, they can accrue 14 RATGs per week. That's a huge difference. This indicates that aero developers from the top and bottom teams would likely be designing with different philosophies. On average, each CFD run would use 3,000 allocation unit hours. Now, I don't have enough information on the types of CFD that F1 teams do, but I've heard and would expect that this is vastly in excess for pure steady state simulations, meaning it could be common to see unsteady simulations. Finally, if you assume each geometry you take to the wind tunnel has been effective in CFD, you require a 16% CFD success rate. This honestly seems really high, so I wouldn't be surprised if teams are putting geometries which haven't fully been optimized or haven't actually been proven in CFD straight to the wind tunnel. So in this video, I outlined some of the most interesting aerodynamic testing restrictions, and I hope you enjoyed. See you next time.